chat. So again, my name is Lori Krupp, and I'm with the National Catholic Reporter as a Director of Donor Engagement. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here today on behalf of everyone at NCR and Global Sisters Report. We're really delighted about today's timely session and the experts that we have available to us to talk about it and keep us informed about something we care so passionately about. Um, I wanted to let you know that today our session is being recorded and post session, probably uh, tomorrow or Friday, you will receive a link with the recording and any references that are mentioned during the session today, we will keep track of and send you a link to those as well. So to prepare for today's session, I had two choices. I could try to prepare myself, which would not go well, or we could ask an expert. And I'm thrilled for you that I'm able to announce that a member of our board of directors, David Bonnier, has very graciously agreed to facilitate and host us today. So thank you to you, David, and I will turn it over to you. Well, thank you, Laurie, uh, very much for, the, for those comments. And um, I thought the way we might proceed is uh, I would talk a little bit, just a very little bit, about uh, my thoughts on the book. It's a great book, by the way, and it's a very moving book. Uh, and then I would introduce Chris, our author, and the man of the hour, as, and then go and introduce uh, Sister Anna as well, uh, who I had the great pleasure of meeting in Ukraine while also over there. So first of all, let me just say that Chris was kind enough to ask me to do a blurb for the book. And I did, and I'd just like to quickly read it for you. A veteran author of the struggles in Haiti and Sudan and wherever hunger looms, Chris Erlinger now tells in his penetrating and compassionate style the stories of refugees and their caregivers in war-torn Ukraine. He finds solidarity in Ukraine, Poland, and other nations where religious people and their communities have banded together, opened their hearts, wallets, and homes to the victims of Vladimir Putin's heinous aggression. The stories of generosity will overwhelm you and rekindle faith, hope, and love in a world hungry for stories of charity that are seasoned by mercy. Chris uh, Erlinger is an international correspondent for the Global Sisters Report, a project, uh, as you know, of Na the National Catholic Reporter, for which he covers uh, the impactful humanitarian work of Catholic nuns from across the globe. A prolific journalist and author, Chris has co-authored three powerful investigative works into international crises, including Food Fight, Struggling for Justice in a Hungry World, Rubble Nation, Haiti's Pain, Haiti's Promise, and Where Mercy Fails, Darfur Struggles to Survive, which the late Archbishop Desmond Tutu commended as required reading for all caring people. Chris has reported from South Sudan and Darfur, as well as numerous and other locales, including Haiti, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Israel, and the occupied territories, Kenya, Ethiopia, and Liberia, and most recently, Ukraine. Hope Among Turmoil, a Global Sisters Report series on the war in Ukraine, which Chris has contributed to, has been honored by the Associated Church Press, the Religion Communications Council, the Religion News Association. Chris has been named one of the 2024 Writers of the Year by the Catholic Media Association, and he resides in New York City. And before I turn to Chris, I want to introduce also Sister Anna Adrusliv, who is one of our heroines who provided safety and sustenance and shelter during the great migration of Ukrainians in the winter of 2022. She, along with sisters from their order, the Order of uh, St. Basil the Great, have been in the forefront of assistance to refugees. Sister Anna was born in 1988, but the memories of oppression under Soviet communism were close at hand for many years through family and through her other 
sisters at the monasteries and convents. Many of her elderly sisters, some now long deceased, hid in the same basement of their monastery in Lviv in Western Ukraine during the German occupation of Ukraine in World War II. Sister Anna's own grandmother had vivid memories of hardship, deprivation, and the fear of saying, what was on your mind? Thinking, well, if I, you did, you could end up on a train in Siberia. Sister Anna had some two dozen fellow religious, some in their 90s, uh, have their emergency bags packed in case bombs are going to fall. I had the honor of visiting Sister Anna in the monastery in Lviv, where she graciously showed me around, including the basement, with the mattresses and the bedding to accommodate others in case the air raid sirens alerted them of a potential Russian bombing attack. So, Sister, it's really great to see you again, and thank you so much for what you have done and continue to do on behalf of, of justice um, and freedom. So I thought we would start off after having gotten that out of the way, and then I will kind of move aside and let Chris and Sister Anna uh, engage in the discussion. And uh, I have a, a quote that I'd like to start with Chris with, and, and he can you know say any introductory remarks he would like at the beginning as well. But the quote is from Archbishop Boris Gudziak, and he's quoted in your book. Bishop Gudziak wrote, the present resilience in the face of a brutal invasion is one of is one stage in Ukrainian, Ukraine's ongoing pilgrimage from fear to dignity. Ukrainians are freeing themselves of post-totalitarian drama and complexes, claiming their God-given worth and discovering their identity as people beloved by the Lord. And then he concludes by going on and saying, if Americans do not see themselves as being subjects of Britain, if Brazil will never again be a colony of Portugal, Argentina or Uruguay of Spain, Algeria or Morocco of France, if blacks will never be slaves of whites, Ukrainians today are saying, we will never again be colonial subjects of the Russians. Today they are articulated through a resistance by the whole nation paying the highest price. Uh, you want to give us your thoughts on that or any other subjects that you're interested in talking about at the beginning? Chris. Sure. No, David, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I have to say it's it's wonderful to be here with you and with Sister Anna, who, uh, uh, in addition to uh, giving me... Uh, shelter of a of a sort when we were when my colleague greg and i were traveling um she's also become a friend and it's just just marvelous and i've i've learned so much from her and from the ukrainians i've i've met um and, and i also just want to briefly say before we get lost in the discussion i really have to thank my ncr and gsr colleagues for their help in, in all this uh that would include my editors uh gail pam uh stephanie and our publisher, Joe, um, they were all very patient with me in what was a kind of a difficult and very <laughs> fast paced project. Uh, but they've very much supported me in this uh, this time of reporting from and about Ukraine. Yeah, I mean, I can only and I, I want to defer uh, shortly to, to Sister Anna about the subject of colonial you know, control. But I think I think for many Americans, uh, I think that the depth of history that um, has moved the Ukrainians to resist the Russian Russian domination it, it goes of course it goes back centuries but I don't think I was fully aware of uh, how deeply felt that 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 resistance goes and I think that's a, a fact that's been perhaps missed a bit in some of the some of the reporting from from Ukraine um, but it's a, I think, a very, very important fact of the dynamic. And I, I want to de defer to Sister, to Sister uh, Anna on this. I do remember Anna, you telling me the story of, I think it was your grandfather, right, who was, um, was um, exiled to Siberia, and um, was was he not? Uh, he he lost his life there, I think. Correct. Um, so um, to me, that was just that that was a one of those stories that that makes an impact 
and it tells sort of a wider story about uh, why Ukrainians are the way they are today. So, Anna, perhaps you can you can speak to that. Thank you. And hello, David, from Kyiv now, not to leave. <laughs> I'm living in Kyiv and just the siren just uh, get off, if I can say that. So, um, well, my grandfather, he was a priest. He was Greek Catholic. So we have a Greek Catholic church in Ukraine and Orthodox church. And we have Orthodox church, Ukrainian, and Moscow, you can say like that, you know, from the Moscow. So in 1946, uh, the uh, we had like not the 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 priests were had a meeting in Lviv, where uh, all the Greek Catholic priests came there without bishops because our bishops were already in some kind uh, parts of of Russia in Siberia or somewhere else. And they chose to be like, they, they asked, would you like to be a Greek Catholic church or let's go and we will be Orthodox church. So a lot of these priests just uh, put the hands uh, up and said, okay, but none of them wanted that. But the history says that uh, a lot of those priests knew the uh, communism and knew what they can do to them. Like they can take the children and uh, they can kill them. So they had like, I would say no choice. I, I would say like that because it was a very scary time for everyone who lived in Ukraine. And then Greek Catholic Church were underground for some time till 1991. And nuns couldn't wear no monastic uh, clothes, none of them. And if you were a priest, you should be really uh, like <laughs> like a spy, you can say, because nobody can know you are a priest and you're going to some... Uh, they didn't have churches. They, they had just like apartment or really small flats and they went there to some homes and they prepared the mass there. So we didn't have church. And my grandfather, Ilya, he was a priest also. Like my great grandfather, he was a priest and my grandfather. So when they came to him and asked, are you going to be an Orthodox priest or are you going to Siberia? He said, no, that, that's why he, he had no choice again. They just took him and like, a lot, a lot of families, a lot of priests, a lot of young people, children, they just went there. You 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 didn't have you didn't have this this uh this um you didn't have a voice, I would say like that. You couldn't say no. Even if now police will come, we can call somewhere, we can make it like a scene we, we can please uh, check if is that correct i can i can call I, I have somebody to call somewhere but that time you couldn't it just they everyone was so afraid the neighbor will not help you you know that's why that's why uh when a lot of jewish children were rescued by our Ukrainian priests, nuns, and monks. That's amazing. That's a lot. Because they knew what can happen. They were not so afraid then. But regular person were really afraid at the time. So yes, and my grad went there and he died there. So I didn't know him. Well, maybe I couldn't, but... Mm -hmm. And that's the history of my family. And the history of my family is that my grandma, when she was 16, they came to their home. They took my uh, my grandma's father, mom, and brother, and they just went to Siberia. And this is was the stories in my childhood, you know, because uh, I used to live in west of Ukraine, and we had different kind of thinking a little bit than 
the east part of Ukraine or central part of Ukraine. Because, uh, again, it's history. It's history. Why we have in eastern part of Ukraine not Ukrainian people, people because in 1932, 33, they had, um, they didn't give the people anything to eat. Um, um, it was famine that time, so people died. And it's then very, it's, a very, okay. it's a very famous famine, very famous. Yes, famine. yes. Millions. So Ukrainian people died. Who came on their place to live there? People from Russia, you know. There is there were free land. Please come and, and live there. <laughs> so that's why. But also for me, it was very interesting because uh, also from childhood, I know that the people from Eastern Ukraine, they were talking mostly in Russian. And then when I saw one interview, an elderly woman like she was maybe 80, 90, I don't know, if, you know, she was older and she was talking in Ukrainian and it was something unusual that there were people who, who knew Ukraine, who knows how to speak Ukrainian, but their children and, and kids, they didn't. They choose to be different, like choose to, to speak Russian because it's more and more famous you can say you know more bad or you like more from the city <laughs> so yeah that that's the history and um like david said uh, it, it goes back much much more back like centuries you can say yes that famine yes. that you talked about uh, sister anna as, as chris just mentioned uh, four million people were, were killed by orders of Stalin and uh, the forced famine or, or called the uh, Holodomor. Uh, it was incredible, uh, the suffering that resulted from that. And and it's on Do the minds of Ukrainians. Ukrainians remember that very well because they've had so many of their family that suffered from that. Mm -hmm. It's Yes, it, it's and it's part of our life, like of our you know, uh, Ukrainian history, and it goes with us, you know, uh, most of the time, I'm afraid that I, that I wasn't hungry. I don't know why, why, why should I? I have everything, we have shops, you can go and buy something, but it's like in my uh, mental, you know, uh, uh, memory that it will happen. And the most interesting part that I thought it was so difficult that nobody knew about it. But my cousin's grandma, she said when she was little girl, they knew about it. She said to her father, do you know they have no food there? There is famine there in east of Ukraine. And he said, Shh, be quiet. You didn't hear it. You can say nobody about it. They knew, but nobody could do anything again, you know. That's that's why when we have help now, it's it's like rewriting the history because that time nobody could help. If even if they wanted, they said that in the middle of the like in central, so th there was like wagons like uh, with with food. They they they, they it, it was going there to east of Ukraine, but they stop it, like trains with food, but they stop it in the middle, so it didn't go further. They were blocked. It's good we, it's good we have communication, Zoom, video, phones, internet for now that we can share, you know. That time they couldn't. They, they had just radio and just one information. So it was much, much different than in Europe and USA. Thank you for that. Chris, uh, can I raise another issue with you? I was moved by your writing of Svet, uh, Svetlana, who migrated from, I think it was, you said, Metropole, down in the south uh, of Ukraine, up to Krakow in Poland. 
And you asked her what it meant to be Ukrainian. And can you tell us what she said, basically? Well, I think she she said that it uh, it it meant freedom. Mm -hmm. um, um, that was, I think, the key word she used. Um, I don't remember the the rest of the quote, but what what, what sticks with me is that is that is that notion of of, of freedom, also um, a sense of uh, a sense of community, um, and uh, something that was clearly. Um, you know, clearly destroyed uh, with the with the with the full scale invasion, which began in February 2022. Um, I think what was what was so moving to me was uh, and David citing um, one part of the book where I spent some some pages talking about about Setlana's experience, and um, I wanted to make it. A point in my in my travels to to see her, and I saw her I think three times, uh, in in various assignments. I mean, always always in Krakow. But I was I was just curious about how you know how she was doing, and um, she mentioned uh, uh, when I first interview her, she was she was still she and her, her daughter, uh, who by the way is in the military and who went went back to Ukraine because she felt a, a, an obligation to. Uh, go back and serve serve in the military uh they were they were you could tell they were both you know shell shocked really and um they were they were traumatized and they both said that they thought they would be returning you know within oh you know two months let's say two or three months well it's quite clear that that wasn't going to happen and she uh, i think the second time i saw her she ruefully said well that's 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 not going to happen. But but the first time I saw her, she just kept uh, mentioning the, the beauty of her city and the fact that the city is known for its cherry trees. And uh, it was an image that I used in the book and in, in my previous reporting. And it was just such a lovely, lovely image. Um, I hope she can return. Um, but as the last I, I knew of, about about Sitlana, she she stayed with a, a in a house uh, she's greek catholic so uh she uh, had some connections with people in caritas and so they were able to accommodate uh help uh svetlana get get to the uh, the dominican convent and um so i that's where i saw her several times uh but the last time i was in krakow early this year i found out that, that she had left and that she was starting life on her own, um, and I don't know anything beyond that. But I, I was very, I was moved and touched that she had, I think, started to make that that transition to a a new life in in Poland. Not a not an easy life. Uh, she said she was struggling with learning Polish, but um, but she was uh, doing some online work uh, for her degree in theology. She was teaching catechism. And uh, I, I think cleaning houses, as I, as I recall, like so many Ukrainian women who were in Poland, that's how they were supporting themselves and their families. So uh, it was a very touching, very touching story. And I hope somehow, maybe someday I can see her again and hopefully she'll be returning to her, to her home city. Yeah. You know, Sister Anna, along those same lines, when, Chris contacted you by way of WhatsApp exchange to see how you were in, I think it was April, right? In February was the full invasion. Of course, this has been going on for 10 years now, but, uh, but for most people in the world tuning in more recently in, in 2022 in February, in April, uh, there was this terrible massacre at, at, at uh, Bucha, and uh, which is a suburb of of Kiev, uh, and there was also bombings in western Ukraine where where you were, where the monastery was. And Chris, I remember quoting you as uh, as expressing incredulity, but not surprise. You said you were fine, but we also are terrified too. Deep inside, all of us uh, knew this would happen. 
the murder, the raping, this kind of horror, which I take from your previous comments, uh, is in the history. And it happened to your own family. And I think you kind of explained that back in your first comment uh, to us this afternoon, but uh, this evening for you. Uh, but if you want to give us your sense of when Bucha happened in Urpin, these are places outside of Kiev, suburbs really, that really took a, a, a hor horrific uh, hit in terms of massacre. Uh, what kind of feeling did, did you have in your fellow sisters and others when, when this was made public? All these war crimes basically were committed in that city. Um, first, I want uh, uh, I ask Holy Spirit to come and, you know, answer for me because it's something really nice to talk about the book, about what's going on in Ukraine. And first thing that coming that I'm happy it's not coming it's not happening now you know that that's what I'm thinking now I'm happy it's not happening again uh, uh you know because our soldiers are fighting like this man that I can see every day because they are there uh the our east part of Ukraine where the invasion is what can I say? As a woman, as a sister, it was terrible for us. What happened to these women, these boys, and even this this man and and you know, uh, girl, girls and and women and families. Uh, you know, I, I want to talk about one, uh, not about maybe Butch because it's very difficult. You know, this this. Uh, this no because it was very very young girls but i'm thinking about one medical soldier uh, i'm sure you saw somewhere on her on the photos uh she was uh, i think in prison in russia for some time and then uh, uh, she came back and she went to europe for rehabilitation physical psychological but I saw this photo of her when she's standing and she's standing only back to the camera, you know. She didn't not, uh, there was like close interview when she was saying what's, what happened to her in the prison in Russia, not, not even in Ukraine. Uh, it was close interview, but on that photo, I can say what happened. The, the person who couldn't show her face, uh, you know, to the camera because it was it was something terrible what happened to her and uh you know we, we know about this uh, what happened in bucha because we have documentary we have reports about it but we don't know what's going on now with the soldiers who are I I in prison there in russia you know and i think they do terrible things to them yeah. and there's women and men there you know it it's not only it's not only butcher it's not only pain it's still going on somewhere we don't know somewhere right now soldiers on the the, the, the on some point there some kind of eastern ukraine somewhere we don't know because they have their secret locations but we don't know what's going on there we we don't know with uh you know, will the bomb will just drop now, right now, or will they fight till morning? And it just that question that you ask, it's very difficult to answer because nobody wants that to that, that happen to somebody. You know, if you just on the war and you just like going down to, to the basement and you are waiting for the bomb, that that's one thing, yes because it's the bomb. But when you know that somebody can come and take you and do whatever they want, okay. if, if they, they kill you, that's okay. But they can do uh, bad things, you know, and yes. not even for girls, not, not, not. So it's just a very difficult question. Yeah, yeah. You know, we, you, we you know what, when, when I was there, 
uh, I came back this press past April with Father uh, uh, Daly and yes. a couple of other people, and that's what I saw you. We went to Bucha afterwards, and uh, uh, I wanted to go there because one morning in April, the New York Times had a big spread in the newspaper about the massacre that occurred there that took anywhere from 500 to 600 lives. Uh, and they had pictures, photojournalism, which was quite magnificent what the New York Times can do that, with that. And I was looking at this picture and this woman had her hand on her mouth looking with horror at what she was seeing in her backyard in Bucha. And under that caption was the name Gavrilou. Well, that's my family name. Now, I didn't know her, but it really made that whole terrible, horrific incident so much more impactful for me uh, because it it's the same name as the family has. My grandfather came from Ukraine in 1912 and uh, from a little town called uh, Stetsova, which was near Sinatin. So, um, but that was a long time ago. But the horror of it was just very, it was pretty overwhelming. And, um, and somebody should pay a price for that, don't you think? I mean, the, the, that, that incident and that in, incident in Irpin, which is the next city over from Bucha, uh, is being looked at by the International War, Com uh, War Crimes Commission. And hopefully they will bring uh, an indictment for what happened there. I mean, people were executed, hands behind their back, gunshot wounds to the head. And it was a horrific story. And, and of course, and what, what Sister Anna was saying about things, uh, maybe the worst has stopped but there are still you ukraine is still feeling the effects uh daily of this of this war let me i i just i wanted to read just a little excerpt from from the book so if you in, indulge me sure. um, this is the very very end very end of the book um when i note that uh, i completed the very final stages of the book while making i made a short trip to kiev in, in july just a few months ago and except for the occasional air raid sirens, it was quiet, basically, up until the final day. At mid-morning on July 8th, Russia launched a barrage of missile attacks across Ukraine, killing at least 40 people. The explosions uh, shook the Ukrainian capital. They were the first rocket attacks I heard while I had ever been in Kiev. And they, they, I mean, I will say they were terrifying. They, uh, as I describe it here, they pierced the heart and shook the soul. One of the buildings destroyed was a children's hospital, the nation's largest such facility. And um, dozens of emergency personnel and volunteers gathered to assist in re uh, rescue efforts. Now, luckily, children at the hospital had been evacuated uh, before they attacked after air raid sirens sounded. Um, now, the Russian military, not surprisingly, denied responsibility, saying the hospital attack improbably was caused by a Ukrainian anti-aircraft missile. But United Nations personnel in Kyiv said the evidence pointed to Russians' culpability. Um, and the Ukrainian officials said the case should go to the International Criminal Court, which is already seeking to prosecute Russian leaders, including President Putin, for alleged war crimes, such as forcibly deporting Ukrainian children to Russia. I quote Sister Anna here, my friend. She was not in Kyiv at the time. She had uh, joined other sisters of St. Basil the Great at a retreat in Western Ukraine. We exchanged texts. Despite everything Sister Anna had told me about the brutal nature of Russia's war against Ukraine, she said that, and again, speaking of this attack on the hospital, children's hospital, even this was something unbelievable for all of us. I asked Sister Anna if she felt resurrection was far off now. Yes, she replied. But she, but did she believe also that Ukrainians continue living in hope? And the last quote is, yes, we do. 
So I hope I hope I did justice to that to that experience, Sister Anna. Yes, we do still live in hope. It's it's weak hope now. I can say that maybe I, I feel myself because, you know, it's not stopping. Uh, I mean, the invasion, I mean, the bombs, I mean, the, like, funerals, you know, it's not stopping. You, you, you can even imagine how many funerals we have, especially in the VU, especially in the those military churches that that's a lot lot uh, how many missing people we have and it goes it, it gives us kind of depression i would say in the beginning you can remember everyone was up everyone was going to help uh, that, that's i think that's the same that russia didn't uh take uh, didn't understand, didn't even think about it. That people, Ukrainian people, people from abroad, they will, you know, go up and help our military. And during these two years, it's like people, you know, have less hope. Uh, not only because uh, of this bombing, also because of the government. You know, we had this hope that the government will help a lot that they will i don't know change the country you know but it didn't happen and we have this different reports about uh, some kind of uh, government people who took a lot of money who selling bullet bullets for it cost 3000 like like you can say $100 but they sent for $300 and those bullets didn't even come come to the place you know so that that's that's you know it it take it, it give us depression a little bit but and you know and when i talk to people like different we want to the the, the this war ended you know we do want but i have my cousin he came from canada he was uh i don't know he's here he came got coming back to canada for five years and he's coming like with new hope. He wants to, to make new drones, you know, that we don't have enough uh, men, people uh, to, to fight this war. But we have machines who can help us. And he has this idea. We already have a lot of people who's making these drones, you know. And he has this idea and gives more hope that anyway, when our regular people think there is no hope the god gives this hope again you know because it's for two years it's it's difficult we have like we live our life uh you know i i can tell you about one one situation with my friend she has a son her son is 14 years old and she already she was so angry you can even imagine she said what should i do should I stay here and my son go to the war and die? Or should I go abroad and leave my Ukraine, you know? And he's only 14 and she's already afraid. And that's the kind of depression we have because we don't know what tomorrow will bring. I can see these young people, uh, I can see they, 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 go to the, they go to the university, but what next? Will they finish this university? Will they go to the war? That that's kind of not hope because it's like I I was listening, you know, because I'm I'm trying not to live through all these two years because it's very difficult. If I going back, it's like it's like darkness, darkness. It's very difficult time, especially the start of the invasion. This three months, it it was. It's like it's so difficult. It's so painful to go back there with my mind to my memory in the beginning even this being butcha it's it's very difficult we 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 remember we know what about it we'll never forget but sometimes we try not to sing because we need to live and we need to live in ukraine sometimes i give myself a question if if it happened and something happened to ukraine Will I stay here? And I don't know the answer.
I don't know because it's very painful, it's very difficult, and then I would, and I just know what will, what will happen, you know. It will be like you said, like slaves, no mm. choice, uh, nothing, and I I don't know. That's why I think that's why we are afraid, you know. And and we have no no help from our government. This thing that we see on the TV that Zelensky goes there and there and talking. I, I just love the news when they give us some some weapon, you know, some guns. That's good news, <laughs> you know, because our soldiers can something fight with. That that's that's the thing. And I, I just hope, you know, we are praying all the time. You you can't even imagine I'm working in the church. And you can imagine how many mothers comes and they just like, I don't know where's my son. Or his dad, or his, we don't know where he is, you know, or he's alive. It's so, then we have this funerals, then we have uh, these prayers for soldiers. Every person who, who we have this, um, uh, well, you can write, uh, for the mass that you want some that the mass were praying for this person so everyone is for the soldiers for ukrainian soldiers for ukrainian soldiers everybody's right he did so like we all still you know we're still praying that that's our hope i would say that if he like that that's our hope you know that mm -hmm. god knows what he's doing because a lot of people comes and asking, where were God when this happened? You know, I had this, um, I was in Medjugorje this, this, this summer. I had an opportunity that's amazing place. And if anybody, anyone have a chance, please go. That's amazing, amazing to be and praying all together because there are people from around the world and all praying together and different languages. And you know, and I was thinking there, and I had this, I had this kind of answer. In Ukraine, we had a lot of abortions, many, many during um, independent Ukraine, during before in USSR. It's like it was like, like every second, uh, future mom could could be mom went and had an abortion. A lot you can say about tens, like. And they, I had this answer in my head that those old pe children who would protect Ukraine, but they not born, they weren't born, born, because you know they died, you know, before they were born. So and and that's why we have this kind of 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 war now. That's why, because anyway, uh, the same, it has the history also, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. You know, the uh, power of prayer, Chris, you wrote very eloquently about in sort of at the end of the book and when you were talking about Zaporizhia in the South and Sister Lucia, Lucia. And this is what you wrote in terms of Sister Lucia. Sister Lucia said, monasteries are to show hospitality and the sisters are to show hospitality in their work. Happiness is in small things. Even if I just pray with them, that is enough. Now she's talking about the elderly women mostly who are caught up in these areas of conflict along the, the conflict line in, in the South and the East old older women they are older ladies with nothing to their name except memories and the charity of the nuns at the monastery sister lucia went on to say we have to see the light not the darkness for us we all know about destruction and death but it is important to celebrate life we want to be an island of light it was beautifully written and it really highlights just what you said, Sister Anna. It's, uh, we have to go on and we have to find the light. And yes.
people do it. I mean, the resilience of the people of Ukraine is quite amazing, amazing. And the religion is a big part of it. It sustains them through these dark times. Do we have other comments? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say just just briefly, I, I mean, I think for, for the sisters, I think that that power of prayer is very, very, very important. And um, I what, what impressed me was that they're, they're just, as we've heard Sister Anna this afternoon, um, they have faced up to that darkness um, and they're, they're, it's right in front of them. And so when they talk about the, the power of hope, uh, it's, it's something that is not easily, um, you know, it's not easily done, but, um, but the inner resources of the people in the faith community, I think is uh, uh, in, in these very trying moments is, uh, is astonishing. So and that's one of the things the book is one of the things the book is certainly concerned about. I think your description of the, the church in Poland is is uh, quite moving as well. I, I call it the Polish miracle because you have these millions and millions of Ukrainians pouring into Poland. And Poland just opened their arms brought them in, took them into the monasteries, the churches, the retreat houses, uh, millions of people. And it was done without one refugee camp, no tents. They were brought into homes and churches and buildings. I've that covered, is, uh, yeah, I've covered humanitarian emergencies throughout the world and have always, for example, in, in, in Africa, let's say, uh, or in let's say Haiti uh, after after the earthquake, um, where displaced people are put into camps and in large large settlement areas, and there was there was there was none of that. I saw none of that in Poland. Um, it was a quite an amazing you know, quite an amazing um, sight, and I think it very much touches on the the title of the book, which is the a sense of solidarity among mm -hmm. among people and a sense uh, of of mercy, so those two those two things commingling uh, is a quite an uh, quite a moving thing to to witness. Your your book is filled with just moving pieces like that, and I highly recommend it for those of you who are out there and listening to this. It's a very moving book in many many ways. Oh, David, thank you. And let me and let me just show. I'll just show people. Uh, yeah. I have to do my ten seconds of plugging, plugging the book. But but here it is. Uh, it's a lovely cover, beautiful Ukrainian colors uh, in in the design. It's a it's a quite it's a hardback book. So um, I'm very very thrilled that it's finally out out in the world. So it's a beautiful book, and you're very modest, Chris, because most authors that I see on TV have that book over their shoulder and their left shoulder and their right shoulder. <laughs> so everybody sees it for the whole time that they're on television and you, you uh, brought it up at the very end. So thank you for sharing it with people and they, sure. where can they, where can they buy it? Where can they buy your book? Well, it's on, it's on, on the usual channels, like, like uh, uh, Amazon, for example, uh, there is, I, I think everyone on, who is here today has received information about how they can get a 20% uh, discount on the book by using uh, the publisher's uh, platform. Uh, it's uh, Morehouse Publishing. It's a imprint of church publishing, which is affiliated with the, with the Episcopal church here, here in New York city. Um, but yeah, there, there's a link that everyone can, can use and can get a, a uh, there's a code you use and you can get a, a 20% discount. So that's, that's one way to do it. But uh, of course, Amazon is, is another way. Um, we still have to figure out a way to get the book to, to Ukraine. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll somehow figure that out uh, on a, at some point. So. Thanks. It would be yeah. nice if someday it were translated into Ukrainian. That would be, that would be, that would be wonderful. So. Hello, Chris, I can do it. <laughs> oh, there, she, there you go. All right, all right. We'll, we'll, I hope. Right now, <laughs> we'll look into that. We'll look into that. Thanks. Yeah, that's good. To yeah. know. <laughs>
as told by Sister Anna, yes. <laughs> well, well, listen, it's really been a, a great pleasure to talk to both of you and uh, to share this hour that we've had with uh, so many out there who have tuned in. I think roughly 100 have joined us at some point or another. So uh, is there any other questions or comments that you'd like to make before we adjourn? Well, just to say, I know uh, with these things, uh, we didn't have time for questions from people. I, I would tell Lori, I'm certainly happy to, if Lori wants to forward questions to me and and to our to Anna and, and David, maybe we could answer some of the questions uh, uh, via email, for example. Um, sorry, we didn't get to those, um, but I think it was important, particularly to hear Sister Anna's testimony and. Um, and hear of her experiences. So I thank her and I thank David as always for his commitment to Ukraine and for the nice blurb that he gave the book and also helping me uh, as someone who was quoted in the book. So uh, anyway, thank, thank you uh, to both of you. Thank you. Thank you, sister. I know it's getting late out there in Ukraine. <laughs> But I can say I can have I have few minutes to say thank you for both of you and three of you and fifty six right now for all of us for you know making this Zoom meeting and you know to remember me my hope I, I I'm sure there that's supposed to be in the book because when Chris first asked me do you what what do you think I said we have a lot of hope and we know we will win. So thank you for remembering, you know, for the, I remember that, that it's not so bad right now yeah. because it, it looks bad, but it's not. And yes, sir, when, that, I, that when I was in Ukraine the first time, about two years ago, I was given this. This is the, <laughs> the triant of a Ukraine symbol, and it's on a little plaque. And I, I wear it like a scapula. I wear it outside. And I wear it every day. And I wear it every day because I want people to ask me about what it is so I can tell them about Ukraine. And Thank secondly, you. it reminds me what my goal is for today, to do something, to do something about Ukraine. Mm. So we got a lot of work to do. But we just have to keep moving ahead and do the best we can, okay? Because you're good people. Ukrainians are fabulous people. And... They don't deserve what is happening. They don't deserve it at all. And they're trying to stop a thousand years of history from repeating itself. Yes. God bless you. And we, we think of you and daily Thank because you. we know of, of what uh, pressure and fears that are in Ukraine these days. Mm -hmm. So God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, know, you all thinking... for having being with us. Yes. Thank you, everyone. And let us say together, we pray for, Lord, for peace in Ukraine, in hearts, in homes, and in country. For this we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.